I'm very, very happy to welcome Dr. Samantha Baskind here. She's a professor of art and design at Cleveland State University. Uh, she has research and teaching interests in 19th and 20th century American art, uh, the art of the Holocaust, uh, Jewish American art. Uh, also, she, she's published, I'm not gonna list all her publications, there's quite a lot, uh, articles, talks she's given places, books and so forth, but I will mention two books in particular, and these two books are the Jewish graphic novel, and then the Warsaw Ghetto in American Art and Culture. Why am I mentioning those? In part because they're, they're going to be connected to the talk, but also because they're for sale <laughs> <laughs> at the back of the room if you are interested in them afterwards. Uh, the bookstore is selling them. Uh, Cash, credit card, check, um, it's all good. Um, and I'll sign them. And, oh, yeah, okay. yes, I'm completely forgetting and an important bonus is that since she is here, she will sign them. Um, she will personalize them uh, for you. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, <laughs> Dr. Baskin is not just a professor of art and design at Cleveland State. She has actually just been named Cleveland State's very first distinguished professor uh, as of, like, I mean, I guess it's not even official yet, but you just heard like five days ago or something like that. Um, so that is really great news. Um, it's really an honor to her that they decided to, I mean, basically come up with this distinguished professor position and honor her as the first recipient. And I don't know, you know, I have not spent that much time with her so far. Uh, it's been about 22 hours, but I can see why they named her Distinguished Professor. This is gonna be a great talk. Uh, she's a great, interesting person. So with that said, I give you our main speaker. Thank you for that kind introduction, Steve. I'm very excited to be here. This is my first time ever in New Mexico. So I've now been to 49 states. <laughs> Today I want to talk about the enormous Jewish contribution to comics and briefly graphic novels, which are a corollary. And it's interesting because Jews built the industry from the ground up. Is anybody familiar with this story, Jews and comics? A little. Okay, this is a phenomenal success story. And of course it begins with Superman. I'm, I wear my superhero outfit to my, my <laughs> comics talks. I have many blue and red matching outfits. <laughs> so well, how did Jews have such a disproportionate number when it comes to making comics? Jews invented superheroes. Why is that? How did comics translate into graphic novels, novels which we'll cover briefly. And, on, and then are these Jewish comics? Are these characters Jewish? Are the artists and writers, and they're usually separate, there's an artist who makes the work and a writer who then writes the story, they do it in tandem usually. How, what do they say about the Jewish experience? Do they say anything about the Jewish experience? Who's ever thought about Superman and the Jewish experience before, besides me? So the story begins in 1933. Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany, FDR is inaugurated, and in January of 1934, in February of 1934, Famous Funnies number one is released. So there were comics in newspapers, but then some publishers think, well, wait a second. How can we capitalize on that? They reproduced them in little comic books, but soon those ran out. There's only so many that you can reproduce. So we need to now have new comics written. Well, who's going to do that? It's like, like it's a low field, it's a new field. Well, in come the Jews, because they can't get jobs in advertising agencies, there's quotas, and a lot of these artists and writers are willing to try different things. So they enter into the comic book industry as publishers and as artists and as writers. So two particular artists, two particular artists and a writer change comic book history. 
Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, two teenage boys in Glenville, Ohio, which is just coincidentally like five miles from my house where I live. They are in high school and they write a superhero. There's no superheroes before Superman. They write, about, they write, a, super, write a comic about Superman. It gets rejected. Nobody wants it. Who is this guy? And they finally get it published. On the left is Action Comics number one. First issue, 1938. Um, it sold recently for $2 million. It didn't sell for that much back then. <laughs> Superman ultimately gets his own title. And you can see that the first issue of Superman is a standalone character in 1939. There have subsequently been movies and more comic books and television shows and radio shows and you name it. Superman is arguably one of the most recognized individuals, not people, in the world. Where was Superman born? Krypton. <laughs> so, sometimes, so he was born on Krypton, but he was also born in Cleveland, and he was born in America, and in that way conceived, and that's important because to these two Jewish boys, both um, were children of Eastern European immigrants, come up with Superman. And Superman, he's really a science fiction retelling of the Moses story, Moses and Exodus. Moses was put in a small basket and he left his family to be raised by strangers in a strange land. Superman, stuck in a little craft and sent to Earth to be raised by strangers in a strange land. And Superman also, he's got, he's got to negotiate the living in, two, living in two worlds. Jews have to negotiate living in two worlds. Right, they have their Jewish faith, and especially it's harder like in the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s, and their Americanness. So it's that the acculturation experience, and a lot of Jews, and, and Superman certainly has to figure out how to live as both Clark Kent and Superman. Plus, a lot of Jews change their names. So Superman, does anybody know what Superman's real name is? Kal El. El means deity in Hebrew. Call is a prefix for a lot of different kinds of words, but one is voice, like voice of God, or it can mean swiftness. It depends on how you interpret it. In any case, it's this Hebrew-derived name. His dad was Jor-El. So there's a lot of kind of connections to Judaism, and it's like an assimilationist fantasy. These two kind of nerdy Jewish boys create this ultimate man, right, the perfect man. And on top of that, Jerry Siegel's dad, was killed, um, died in, during a robbery in Cleveland. He owned a haberdashery store, and there was a robbery. He wasn't shot. He had a heart attack from the fear, and he died. So then, all of a sudden, we have this man of steel. He can, you know, he can. Bullets can't penetrate him. He can see anything. He can save the world. He can save petty. He can help with petty crime. But also, one second. He gets the perfect villain. He has, there's no Lex Luthor early on. Luthor, by the way, might bring up Martin Luther, an anti-Semite and um, someone who really hated the Jews back in history. We're, gonna, we're not gonna go into that right now. We don't have a lot of time. But who, who's, who's the bad guy? Who's his arch nemesis? Hitler, Mussolini, Toho, Hirohito, because this is when comics start really happening. There are tons of Superman comic, 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 copycats, there we go. And he battles Hitler in this Look Magazine special where he, it's a two-pager, and he rounds up Hitler and Stalin and takes them to a tribunal. Superman did really his best war work on covers. So inside, the stories would be a little more fanciful. They weren't as much about war. But on the covers, as you can see, we have Superman battling Nazis. He's holding Hitler on the left here. He's got Toho on the right. And he does so with his musculature and his strength. The truth, justice, and the American way. That's what Superman is about. So let's talk about some of those copycats. 
I think most people now know, when I first started working on comics, like there weren't all the Marvel movies, which are fabulous for the most part. Captain America was specifically created to fight in war. So he's specifically created as a Nazi fighter. And he was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Joe Jaime Simon and Jacob Kurtzberg. Names changed. So two Jewish boys create Captain America. This is the first issue. You can see that Cap is punching out Hitler, big sock to the jaw. And his, he had a little sidekick, Bucky. This is the first kind of, where you start having children or like young boys as sidekicks. Batman and Robin might come to mind too, where you have the kid sidekick. There are, there, there are tens of thousands of comic books being produced. Comic books are at their height. It's the golden age of comics. And they're fighting war. They're fighting in the war. And there's always been sort of discussions. So why didn't the superheroes just go and finish off the war and end it soon, end it early? Well, we know why. They're fictional. But they were really taken to heart. And again, it's on the covers they do most of their war work. And finally, when Cap was invented, Steve Rogers was a scrawny art student. Sound familiar? Like one of these artists, one of these, when I say Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, I mean writer Joe Simon, artist Jack Kirby. And he really, Jack Kirby really creates this cinematic Marvel style that has lasted for decades. And so Steve Rogers wants to enlist. He's an art student. He's scrawny. He, can, he doesn't get, he can't enlist. So he becomes, he gets a super soldier serum that was administered by Dr. Reinstein, which was a play on Einstein. So World's Finest Comics was a combination of Batman, Robin, and Superman. Batman and Robin were also created by two Jews, another you know, artist and writer tandem, Bill Finger and Bob Kahn. And we can see here, they're knocking out the axis with bonds and stamps. These comic book covers become propaganda. They're really propaganda because they're they're encouraging people to get bonds and stamps and to support the war. This is the beginning, it's spring. It's spring training, they're throwing baseballs. And there are characters here, and some of them are difficult caricatures, but this is, these, are, these comics are products of their time. Batman gets his own title eventually in 1939. He's simultaneously in world fi World's Finest Comics. And we can see, once more, we're gonna ensure the 4th of July. You must buy war bonds and stamps. But the true heroes, the true fighters of the Nazis, are the American soldiers. And we also have these patriotic covers. Here we can see Superman with his arm around a soldier. And then we have Robin shaking hands, Batman looking on approvingly. And look at that patriotic cover. These are bright. Even if you're not going to buy a comic, you're going to see them on the newsstand. And you see the cover. So the content is irrelevant to most people who are just walking by, but you see these bright covers. And we're jumping ahead. Fantastic Four. Also, lots of movies about the Fantastic Four. My favorite character is The Thing, and you're gonna see why in a second. Plus, he's just so darn cute, as my daughter says. So November 1981. This is just a random cover I picked. Stan Lee takes the helm at Marvel, eventually, and Stanley Lieber, another Jewish figure, he actually fought during World War II, and here we he's a really interesting figure. He only recently died. He lived a long time. We have lots of good oral interviews with him. He's in the movies. Do you ever see, you have to like find Stan Lee in the movies when you watch a Marvel movie? It's like finding Waldo. So I just wanted to show this because we see the thing in the middle. The Thing's name, real name, was Ben Grimm. He was exposed to cosmic rays. He then became basically, basically a rock monster. Over time, his origins were revealed. And I know you can't read this. It's OK. I just wanted you to see what two pages of a comic book look like next to each other, a story inside with the gutters. Those are the white spaces in between. We have to imagine what happens 
in between those little panels. And this is the story. This is remembrance of things past. It's summer 2002. We've moved way, we're way out of our early origins. And in this story, Ben Grimm, the thing, Benjamin Grimm, goes back to Yancey Street. He's from the Lower East Side, which is a very Jewish part of New York. And he goes to see Mr. Schreckerberg. He, he stole from his pawn shop a Star of David a long time ago. He's bringing it back. So he's trying to do a mitzvah, do a good deed, do a good thing. He takes it back, and it turns out that at the time, Mr. Schreckerberg's being um, robbed. So the thing steps in. Schreckerberg is on the ground. He's been basically beat up. Ben Grimm, the thing, gets down there, and he says the mourner's Kaddish in a comic book. So that's a prayer that Jews say when somebody dies. It's in, for their honor. And then Schreckerberg um, wakes up, and he says, oh, I'm OK, Ben. I'm glad you remember your Hebrew school training. <laughs> this is just a comic book. It's not made for Jews. It's just a comic book on the shelf. Judaism is becoming mainstream. It's exciting. Judaism is becoming mainstream. Ben Grimm's origins are being revealed. But the part that I wanted just at the end, which I, I know you can't read, but um, the bad guy says, you're really Jewish? And Ben Graham, the thing, says, is there a problem with that? And he says, no, no, it's just, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> it's funny. There's, like, there's humor in comics. There's seriousness in comics. There's war. There's love. And we're just, we just looked at superhero comics. There's so much more than that. There's war, there's war comics, like I mean really like war comics, like The Unknown Soldier. We have romance, there's detective comics, there's pulp. Their comics are across the board. And the interesting thing is that Jews, again, are at the forefront of all of this. I just wanted to show you the thing. Jack Kirby, who invented the thing, made this drawing that was in his home for years, hanging on the wall. And here he is holding a prayer book, a Sidor, and there's Hebrew. The X-Men, too, have some Jewish elements to them. The X-Men are Marvel Comics. They're also Stan Lee's creation. And with the X-Men, we have a character named Kitty Pride. Her boyfriend, has, Colossus, has died. And in one issue, yard site. She's lighting a yard site candle, which is a Jewish memorial candle. And she very proudly wears her Star of David necklace. What year was that? This is 2002. The previous one also. The previous one oh, is 2002, but this is a coincidence. OK, this is just a coincidence. And in a different issue, the thing has a bar mitzvah. <laughs> and when he's approached to have a bar mitzvah, he's like, well, I'm a little old for that. It's been, and the rabbi said, well, it's been 13 years since you became the thing, because <laughs> Jews have their bar mitzvahs, or their bat mitzvahs around 13. So he had one. And briefly, Magneto, the cha a very challenging figure in the X-Men, mostly a bad guy, sometimes a good guy, he's revealed as a Holocaust survivor. And we can see he shows the numbers on his arm from when he was in Auschwitz. So jumping forward again, Superman and Judaism continue to go hand in hand. This is a very controversial and interesting issue. This is the Man of Steel number 82, and it's from the late 1990s. So think about how far we've come. It's the cover, and this is the cover of, part of this comic is the cover of my book about the Warsaw Ghetto in American art and culture. And that book looks at how the Warsaw Ghetto has been depicted in comics, plays, like Broadway, literature, theater, you name it, over time in fine arts, of course. I'm an art historian by training. And here, he breaks into the Warsaw Ghetto, and he saves the inhabitants of the ghetto. So, and I, I brought this not just because it's the cover of my book, but on April 19th is the 84th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
84th? You do the math for me. 1940, April 19th, 1943. Um, in any case, here he's half in Metropolis and half in the Warsaw Ghetto. So Jews were packed into a sealed, sealed ghetto in Warsaw and they were certain they were going to certainly be killed or you know in the ghetto or deported to Treblinka and they mounted an uprising this is not the comics this is the true story they mounted an uprising they held off the Nazis longer than the Poles held off the Nazis during the Blitzkrieg it was a pretty remarkable episode during the Holocaust so they didn't all survive by any stretch of the means but they wanted to die with honor and here we have Superman entering the ghetto not as a Jewish character necessarily, because that's up for debate. And there have been books actually written about this. A new one just came out a few months ago, and I was asked to review it, and the title is, Is Superman Circumcised? And it won an award for silliest book name. <laughs> the inside's interesting, the name is silly. But the reason I also brought this in is that he does get the Jews out of the ghetto. It's wish fulfillment, right? If only this could have been. But the two boys on the right in the white shirts, they are Baruch and Moisha, and they were sort of an homage to Siegel and Schuster, two boys who created Superman during the worst of times, hoping for betterment for Jews and for the world. Because Superman is also about tikkun olam, which is a Jewish imperative to make the world a better place. And as Jews, Jews are supposed to leave this world better than they brought it, came to it. And so was Superman. That was his mandate from his father who sent him to Earth. Mad Magazine, founded by Jews. Editor was a Jew, publisher was a Jew, Harvey Kurtzman and William Gaines, who was actually the son of Maxwell Gaines, who was an early publisher of comics. And there's lots of Yiddishisms and lots of plays on words and lots of Jewish like things in this comic, particular comic magazine, that was only really apparent to Jews, but there's since been a lot of discussion about it. There's very a lot of Jewish inflected humor and shtick in these. Another interesting comics maker is Harvey P. Carr. Has anybody heard of Harvey P. Carr? Oh, good. And Harvey, and he liked to go by Harvey, had published this comic on its own, American Splendor. Great movie made America, about, called American Splendor about Harvey P. Carr's life. And American Splendor. From off the streets of Cleveland comes. This is just a coincidence, coincidence that I live in Cleveland, that Superman is from Cleveland, and Harvey P. Carr is from Cleveland. And it was like the mundane aspects of life. Just, he, he worked for the VA. He walked down the street, the things that would happen to him. But it's like really the first sort of autobiographical, confessional kinds of comics. He published it himself, self-published, until ultimately he got a publisher. These are two covers. You can just see, I mean, he's schlubby. He's just, let me, he's the figure on the far right. You can see his name, Harvey. This um, issue on the right is fun. Um, his mom, he's got to eat these eggs. They're, not, they're kind of yucky. His mom says, it's good for you, Herschel, because that was his Yiddish name. So lots of little Jewish droppings in Harvey P. Carr's work. This movie, fabulous, nominated for Academy Award. I really recommend it. And so Harvey has different stories. He's just the writer. He has different artists work for him at different times. So there's lots of different Harveys out there. Harvey looks different in lots of different comics. And this one is a, um, today I am a man. It's the last page. After some, a boy traditionally has a bar mitzvah, he says, today I am a man. Well, he, Harvey didn't feel that way during his bar mitzvah. But he did manage to unclog the toilet in his house. And he does, and he says, Today I am a man. So if you're a comics maker in Cleveland, you really have to deal with the fact that Superman was made in Cleveland too. What, what, how do you deal with that issue? And he made this, this story, it's just a, a few pages. 
in which he's at a comic con or like a comic conference and nobody wants his signature they're all they all like superheroes better so he's frustrated and he has that's harvey on top throwing a fit he's drawn by r crumb if anybody's familiar with comics r crumb is a major comics artist and then the rest is made by a different artist but there's a little Yiddish glossary on the top right corner because Harvey sees the Superman Jewish connection. And the glossary, Chazer is a pig, you know, Rachmanis, you know, have pity. So you get the idea. It's just what Superman means to me. Oi is basically what Superman meant to him. And Harvey met the thing. So Harvey brings it all together. And here, the thing comes to Cleveland. This is a real deli in Cleveland. And he says, you know, he basically, the way, the punchline is, the thing's knees hurt, and he hears that Harvey's finally retiring from the VA, where he worked for decades. He's like, can I have your job? My knees hurt. And Harvey had a Marvel Comics artist draw this one, smartly so it would have a Marvel Comics style and feel to it. I want to mention graphic novels. I'm sure some of you have read graphic novels. There's a big graphic novel craze going on right now. It's great. The first, gra the, the first really acknowledged graphic novel was by Will Eisner, who is, was Jewish. And it was a Jewish story. Um, there was three stories that took place in like tenements in New York. These are just two different covers. There's so many editions. Kind of interesting just to see the different covers. But essentially, the, one, the story, the big story, a contract with God, a father makes vows to God, a Jewish man, I will be great, I will follow Judaism, just make my life be good. He made a contract with God, and he had a daughter who was, had special needs. And it's, Eisner is a phenomenal artist, um, very expressive. You can, I think, hopefully see that on the, um, the image on the right. And the highest honor in the comics industry are called the Eisner Awards. Do you want me to start wrapping up or keep going? Keep going? Okay. So Art Spiegelman. I'm sure that you've heard Spiegelman's been in the news. Mouse has been banned in Tennessee. There's like a bad word. And oh, there's naked mice. So I am here to tell you that the most important graphic novel, in my opinion, ever written is Art Spiegelman's Mouse. This is incredible work. It won a Pulitzer. A special Pulitzer for, was given to him. And this is the cover of the first volume. There are two volumes. This is 1986. There's also the second volume comes out in 1991. It is years of work. He interviewed his father, Vladek Spiegelman. Over time, Vladek was a survivor of the Holocaust. Horrible. He was in camps. He was in Auschwitz. His, he, he was, had a, his wife also suffered in the camp. So art has to live with. What is, this com what is this graphic novel about? It's serious. And it's clever. And it's so insightful. It's Vladek's story but it's also art story. What is it like to live with a history that you were not in, but it pervades every moment of your life? And Vladek wasn't an easy man, and art doesn't show him as an easy man. Um, Vladek lived through the horror of horrors, but he was still a racist. He didn't trust anybody. He was, he was a hoarder of money. Art Spiegelman shows his dad warts and all, and also in this graphic novel, um, Spiegelman's mother survives the Holocaust and ultimately commits suicide when Spiegelman's an adult. She can't live with the memory. What makes it also interesting is this is a bestiary of characters. Jews are depicted as mice, Poles as pigs, Germans as cats, and French as frogs. So it's like an allegory. It shows us through an allegory. And Jews were massacred, six million Jews and five million others, 11 million people total were killed in the Holocaust, and Tennessee is frustrated that there's some naked mice in a picture? 
So this is just two images. We have a full page on the left, and I pulled out just a little image on the right because it's interesting, and I wanted you just to see what's happening. When you, want, when you read this graphic novel, there's so much to look at and come back to. There's so much to consume. And we have Vladik and his wife, Anya. We walked in the direction, we're trying to go somewhere safe, but where to go? Um, Art Spiegelman retains his dad's accent a lot of the time here. And you can see there's nowhere to go. The road is a swastika. These are two full pages, and I think they're the two most powerful pages in the entire two volumes. And the one on the left, time flies. It's a play on words. So we have, little, we have panels. Art is wearing a mouse mask. He was not a hunted mouse during the Holocaust, but he feels like it, right? He's taken on the persona of the Holocaust because he's lived the pain of it. He's a, he's a, you know, he's a survivor of living with two Holocaust survivors. And Vladek died of congestive, con congestive heart failure. Um, and then, you know, there's, I guess his, his wife's name was Francois. He's conflating, Art's conflating the past and the present. And he's talking about what happened to his father, and Art's talking about what happened to him. He's at his drawing board at the bottom. And he's conflicted. He is incredibly famous. He has a Pulitzer. He's asked to give talks all around the world based on a two-volume graphic novel he wrote about his parents' suffering. And a movie, that he says, at least 15 foreign editions are coming out. I've gotten a serious offer to turn my book into a TV special or a movie. I don't wanna. In May 1968, my mother killed herself. She left no note. Lately, I've been feeling depressed. All right, Mr. Spiegelman, we're ready to shoot. It's a play on words. There's a watchtower on the right there on the bottom panel. We're ready to shoot the Holocaust. We're ready to shoot the movie. The final page of Mouse, and th those, are the, those are the naked mice. Those are, the, those are symbolizing the bodies of Jews who were murdered systematically. The last page, we're going to skip to the bottom. We have art on the left, and the la left panel at the bottom, one, two, three, down. And we have Vladek. And Vladek said, so let's stop, please, your tape recorder, because he's tired. And he then says, I'm tired from talking Rousseau, and it's enough stories for now. It's over. So the, this is the last page. Rousseau, art had to live in Rousseau's shadow. Rousseau was Vladik and Anya's first son who was killed during the Holocaust. And then at the bottom, there is a tombstone, Spiegelman, with Vladik's date of his life, Anya's date of her life. Art Spiegelman signs his graphic novel. Those are the dates it took him to conceive and write this. I urge all of you to read this if you haven't. And if you have read this graphic novel, I urge you to read it again. It's phenomenal. Comics have been appropriated in various other media. This is a painting by Archie Rand, who is a tremendous artist. He's arguably the, mo the most famous Jewish American artist that's currently living. And he made a series called 60 Paintings from the Bible. This is one of them, this is the first. And he makes them in a comic book fashion. So he takes stories from the Bible that we can all likely recognize. This is Adam and Eve. And he, he said, the biblical text is so arcane. So really, what does it boil down to? We're naked. And he uses speech bubbles, typical kinds of speech bubbles. Um, Eve is holding the apple. We, have, it, we can see that the technicolor of comic books is really highlighted here. And there are 59 more of these. These are all from 1992. They're 18 by 24 inches. And when hung together, they are spectacular. So this is a exhibition 
Um, again, these are from 1992. This exhibition was in 2016, and you can see them hung. This is only part of the ga two galleries, two different views. This is a traveling exhibition. Maybe someday it'll come to New Mexico. So in sum, my children, this is such an old photo. My children are mortified when they were young and I would put it up. But I'm very happy to take any questions. There are Jews, comics, and the graphic novel have so many intersections. It's really a tremendous um, amalgamation of talent and really opportunity for the Jews and for the comics industry. And as you say, up, up, and oy vey. You have a question? <clears throat> Did uh, Superman and the others, but Superman primarily, have appeal outside of the United States and was it ever translated into other languages? So Superman has universal appeal. Superman is recognized across the world and yes, has been translated into different languages. Just as these, the graphic novels I even showed you at the end, um, Mouse has been translated into so many different languages, as has A Contract with God. So yes, um, superheroes and comics have reached vast audiences far and wide. And of course, movies are dubbed, so you know, it's easy for many people to learn about Captain America or Batman, the new Batman movie. They're dubbed, and they can be seen anywhere. So these superheroes are part of worldwide consciousness, at least the Western world. Yes? Yes, I just thought I would make a comment, and that is I found it very, very in interesting um, the juxtaposition of humor with some very serious and very um, sad incidents. And I wanted to make, just mention something. Uh, there was a book that I read many, many, many years ago. It was called Black Like Me, about a white person who uh, went and traveled in the South as a black person, and the prologue said, we only laugh to keep from crying. Thank you. So I'm kind of interested in what happened to Spiegel and Schusterman. Um, can you give us a little background on their lives, and did they end up millionaires from all of their work on Superman? Whew. So that is a loaded question, because they sold the rights to Superman when they were young. So I think it was 1940, they're like, oh, this is a little successful. They sold the rights for not a lot of money, but they were young boys, and they didn't know. And for the rest of their lives, they really fought for some sort of restitution. And they, were, they continued to write and draw Superman comics, but, and were paid more than the other writers and artists for Superman comics. But it's, they got nothing that they should have gotten. I mean, so the rights, I mean, their, their heirs should be, um, Schuster never had children, but their heirs should have been billionaires. And I had the great fortune to interview Jerry Siegel's daughter a few years ago. And here's an interesting tidbit. Her mother was the model for Lois Lane. So she saw an ad in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. She took it. She was a model for Lois Lane. And then went her separate, they went their separate way. She just was the model. And several years later, she she, and she modeled for Schuster. She, came, she comes back, she, meets, she re meets Jerry Siegel, they get married, and they live happily ever after, minus the fact that they should have been gazillionaires and got cheated out of their fortune for creating the greatest superhero. I, thank you. I'm struck the fact that Superman is so obviously Jewish. And yet, it was written, developed, during the 1930s, which saw a peak in anti-Semitism in the United States. 
was there a anti-Semitic response at the time? The Superman is Jewish thesis and discussion. Nobody knew about Superman's Jewishness back then. He was just a superhero. And in fact, Hitler is the only one who sort of thought Superman might be Jewish. And let's there's a, there's a rumor that Goebbels, the minister of propaganda, jumped up in the middle of a meeting and said, you know, denounce Superman as a Jew. But I don't think, you know, here Superman says, I'd like to land a strictly non-Aryan sock on your jaw. Is he saying he's Jewish or is he saying he's an alien? So this whole, the whole Jewish thing was not a thing back then. Are there any other questions? Yes. Okay. Just project it. Okay, yes, so Neil Gaiman, Jewish guy, where would you put him in the whole uh, pantheon of Jewish contributors to comics? All right, Neil Diamond? No, 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 Neil Gaiman, the guy. Neil Gaiman, was. okay, I was gonna say. So Neil Gaiman is Jewish and he absolutely, you know, his Jewishness doesn't come out in his comics so much but he's a vastly important figure, and it just kind of goes along with all of these you know, Jewish, mostly men, who are very important makers of comics in the industry. Trina Robbins, if anybody's heard of her, she was one of the original artists of Wonder Woman, and she's a woman, and she's still alive, and she comes to Comic-Con sometimes, and she has great stories, and she's a really you know, important figure, but as many professions, they were really open to men, mostly, during this large swath of time that I've covered today. Yes, do you want a projector or do you want a microphone? Thank you. I've been reading the relatively newer Miss Marvel series, Miss Marvel, and it's a, you know, probably know, a teen girl who is Muslim and directly portrayed as Muslim. So I'm wondering, with your work with the kind of low-key, maybe, uh, Jewish depiction here and how that's impacted the Jewish community, do you see any connection with Ms. Marvel and how that may impact the Muslim community? So I'll be honest, I do not know much about that comic. Um, you know, my, my work has been really sort of, on comics has sort of stopped lately because I've been working on a 19th century Jewish American Confederate sculptor. So I don't know that, but I will absolutely look for those comics and see what that's about. I do think it's important that other, like, no matter what one's heritage is and whatever one's otherness might be, that this is conveyed in comics, that we're not just a white Christian male mainstream, and that we can see so many different cultures and learn about so many different peoples through this accessible medium of comics. Are there any other questions? When does Wonder Woman first appear? Do you know? So Wonder Woman comes about during this, sort of this moment where superheroes and heroines become a big deal. So we're talking late 40s. She, her origin stories are a little different than in the movies, but she is the first you know, female strong superhero that, that people like, basically. Now, superheroes after the war, Second World War, they kind of, they're not as popular. They don't have a great arch enemy. But Wonder Woman, Batman and Robin, and Superman are the two that kind of hold on, and they have held on over time. And that's when we have to have newly invented bad guys. So the Joker and Penguin existed, I'm talking Batman now, during the war, but Riddler comes a little bit later. And that's when we have like a whole different set of arch nemeses that need to be created. So superheroes weren't quite as popular, that's when romance really gets hot and detective, um, like DC was detective comics, that's what it stood for in its origins. And then superheroes come up farther into, you know, back to the fore. And of course, Wonder Woman now is having a tremendous resurgence, played by an Israeli woman. 
which is just a coincidence. She just happens to be like the most beautiful woman in the world and she's Jewish. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so uh, these heroes uh, were recruited in the anti-Nazi campaign. Mm -hmm. Were they recruited in the anti-communist campaign in the late 40s and early 50s? Really, superheroes and politics don't intermix quite like this again. So Superman, he's not really a liberal, he's not really conservative. There's not a lot more politics. It's this, this particular punch, it's pun intended, this particular moment they're involved, in these, they're involved in politics, but they pretty much steer clear, otherwise, of most wars. Like maybe a little like dip, like a t t dip in the water, but hardly anything at all. It becomes much more lighthearted. Anybody else? Born in the 1930s, mm -hmm. 1940s, um, did the authors ever speak about the fact that they created heroes and why? If that had anything to do with their situation or the situation of the Jews in that period, why creating a hero? I'll repeat the question. So the question is, did any of these comic book creators talk about why they created Captain America or Superman? And in an unpublished work by Jerry Siegel, there, he talks about that this is some sort of wish fulfillment for a poor Jew who also feels scrawny. So but that, we could say that of any other, right? Any challenged teenage boy or girl could feel insecure. But also that he does talk about the war to a degree. And Kirby, who made Captain America and others, um, did talk about it to a degree, but in general, these artists didn't spend a lot of time talking about the impetus for their works, though when we can read into it, and we do have little bits and pieces that help us better understand, like Jack Kirby's portrait of the thing with the Sidor in the Hebrew. I mean, talk about a great artifact to really like make, to legitimize the thing's Jewish um, backstory that comes later on. Yes. Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to add that um, in more recent comics, you get um, like Howard Stark, so Iron Man's father, talking about how he's Jewish from the Lower East Side. And um, really popular in comics right now is Scarlet Witch. She's Jewish, her father is Magneto, and her son has a Jewish wedding, he's gay, and that's in the comics. It's, it's not hinted at anymore, it's like blatantly there. It's, it's just kind of nice. I love that you're reading comics so recently and so <laughs> carefully. Was there any other, any other questions? Steve. Just to, to follow up on that observation, uh, so we saw like Magneto, who was in the camp. We saw Ben Grimm, specifically identifying as Jewish. Who who was the first comic book character to explicitly be Jewish in that way, or, or maybe just at what point does does this type of information become explicit? I've really shown you the earliest ones. So remembrance of things past is just, you know, a huge moment and Kitty Pride, you know, with yard sight and the fact that she even wore her star of David necklace. So it's in that moment which is only very recent. Sorry not to make anybody nauseous. So we're talking this is a 21st century phenomena mostly. And it's, it's surely an interesting development. And I'm not, I, I just wonder what Siegel and Schuster would think of what's happened to their Superman. 
because he's had so many different incarnations and different backstories and you know in the, in the movies he decides to give up his powers because he loves Lois Lane enough but then he realizes that you know his dad's like I don't think you should do this and then ultimately he gets his powers back because he realizes that his mandate on earth is more important than his love for Lois again we could go into a that's a whole semester conversation but you know what to what degree are Jack Kirby or Bill Finger or whomever, whatever artist or whatever writers, what their intentions, what did they mean back then? What do they want for their characters? What does this evolution mean artistically, thematically, and stylistically? There's just so much to think about. But I think, you know, when we can start with this conversation of like from Krakow to Krypton. You know, where did it begin? It began really in this with this Eastern European Jewish origins, and then it went to Krypton and now it's here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, artistically, which would you say are the best done comics? So the question is, artistically, which are the best done comics? So as far as comic books, like proper, my favorite is Jack Kirby. His cinematic, exciting style is just so alive and he's just you know technically he's a really really good artist then as far as graphic novels go i mean stylistically eisner and artistically like as an artist eisner is a phenomenal artist but spiegelman is just so intriguing in the way that he conveys what he's trying to say through gutter and panel and speech bubble so you know it depends and it depends on what day you ask me too <laughs> yes, in the back. So, um, can you go back to the slide where you show Eisner's work? Eisner. Sorry, everyone. There we go. Yeah. So I couldn't help but notice that his signature looks amazing like Walt Disney's. Um, a man who's not known for his love of views. Um, was Eisner making a point with this? I've never read anywhere that Eisner was making a point with this. And I don't think he would. That doesn't seem to be his MO. But it's a good observation, and I never thought about it before. And you're absolutely right. And what's the observation? Oh, okay. That Will Eisner and Walt Disney have a very similar kind of signature. And is Will Eisner, was he making some sort of point or making some sort of comment on Walt Disney who was not sympathetic to Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of not being sympathetic to Jews, are, is there any superhero tradition, you know, not that the U.S. doesn't have its own problems, but let, let me throw Russia under the bus. Is there any Russian comic book tradition or, or other comic book tradition where superheroes are fighting the Jews, where there's anti-Semitic depictions in comic books? Okay, so the question is, have there been any anti-Semitic depictions in comic books made outside of America? Or, or in America. Oh, or in America. Right. And I don't know really, I, I only, I know, what, I know Israeli comics well, and those are very, often going to be very, very political. And as far as I know, I, don't, I do not think so. But, that, but I have very limited knowledge. It's hard to get your hands on comics and graphic novels um, from different countries. So when I do travel to different countries, I went to Poland a couple years ago, and I grabbed a couple Polish um, graphic novels, but of course I grabbed the ones of my interest, you know, stories about the director of an orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. So I didn't, I didn't necessarily, you know, pick up something that I might find something offensive towards Jews, but knowing the world, there's probably comic books that are offensive towards Jews. Yes? Yeah, to follow up on that, there's some um, Arabic comics that came out that are like you rearrange the letters of the evil corporation and it spells out Zionism in Arabic and this kind of thing like that. The, the connection is very, very obvious. Eisner. They were popular, they were popular for the so. Okay. That comic lasted, I think, maybe six months. So, oh, good. But I mean, it was, the implications were clear. 
And Will Eisner wrote a comic book called The Plot, which was like a history of the protocols of the elders of Zion, which was a noxious document about the Jews. It's as if the Jews were writing it because they were, had a conspiracy. In any case, um, it was a whole history of that. It gets a little didactic at times, but it's a graphic novel and it's interesting and it's kind of you know dealing with that kind of difficult literature through the comics book medium. And I wanted to mention if anybody's interested more in the artistic aspects of comic books, Scott McCloud has a phenomenal book about understanding comics. And it's, I assign it to my students in my Jewish graphic novel and comics class. It doesn't tell you how to make comics necessarily. It tells you so you can understand how to read comics, to understand the marriage of text and image. That's it? Okay, thanks a lot, it's been a pleasure.